because if it's slightly bad, the program might go on and do something very, very, very bad. And since intelligence uh, has a, at least has a link to power to change the world to according to, accord to your wants, that can be very tricky. So this concept is tied to the appearance of um, superintelligence. It might be because you have a little uh, computer run very uh, fast and making itself smarter. It might be so that they find some way of enhancing humans, for example, symbiosis with machines, we link up our, link our brains to computers and enhance our own abilities. Or it might also be spread out across society. We might find better ways of uh, doing collective intelligence. Imagine a kind of big society where we get this uh, spontaneous order, we're getting so much amazement out of, from Wikipedia, but now actually improving society instead of just producing one website. Then, of course, we have another interesting possibility. About this, well, how do we even deal with superintendents? Alan Turing, the founder of really of computer science, back in 1951, actually said, once the machine thinking method has started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect that machines to take control. In a way, that's mentioned in Samuel Butler's Ericon, which was old, already then in 1951, when Turing said this. So this is this recognition that, yes, we might get non-human intelligence. That's another very old idea to know that people. <coughs> then, of course, we might also think about this, in general, as a horizon of predictability. Very Vinci, who came and coined the term singularity in this modern sense, did, probably didn't know about uh, John von Neumann. Uh, he said this is a kind of prediction horizon. Uh, once you get superintelligence of this kind of fast we can't say anything about the future. Now, I'm not certain this is true, but he uh, wrote this little essay that a lot of people read that introduced all these ideas together as a bundle. And I think that was both a good thing because people start thinking about it, and a bad thing because we got this jumble of ideas that linked together. Yes, obvious accelerating technological change might make things hard to predict. But it's not obvious that it will make it possible. We might be getting superintelligence, but we've got a whole palette of possible superintelligence, and some of them might be different from others. So we have a rather rich concept. And Kurzweil has done a great service, I think, in bringing it out to a wider audience. Although there is also this problem, of course, that he's adding his own take and the confusion gets even stronger. Because he's so good at talking about it, everybody thinks that it's kind of his concept. Anybody talking about the singularity needs to be in some kind of Kurzweil organization. Which is, of course, very annoying for anybody else who has singularity in the name of their organization. And the basic idea of uh, this kind of great change in humanity is actually amazing. Oh, uh, today I noticed on the Wikipedia page about the singularity a quote from 1847. Uh, by R. Quantum, and I have no clue who he was or what this uh, was in context, but he was talking about the mechanical calculating machines of the era. Say, such machines, by which the skull are made by turning a crack, grind out the solution of a problem without the fatigue of mental application, would by its introduction into schools do incalculable human jury. Oh, it's we already there had this problem of even people cheating with calculators. He continues, but who knows that such machines were brought to greater perfection may not think of a plan to remedy all their own defects and then grind out ideas beyond the ken of mortal mind. And one of the really interesting things is, this was 1847. And still, it didn't go very much. So this idea seems to have kind of flourished now, but not before. Is that just because we're so used to having a lot of fairly smartish machines around, or that they have read enough science fiction to start believing in it? It's a very interesting question. So to get over to what have actually Kurzweil, why do, should we care about this? Well, we're interested in risk at our institute, and singularity seems to be dangerous. Also, it's an interesting philosophical question how much we can discount the future. If the future is going to be worth a lot because it's going to be all these amazing things, maybe we should be saving more for it, and we should be really making sure we don't die before reaching it. The more valuable the future is, the more we want to be there. So the more we should be going for life extension, reducing accident risk, trying to reduce the risk of wars. I think Kurzweil also has a few interesting claims. So kind of summing up here where I think Kurzweil has contributed and is in trouble. He's claiming that there is a law of accelerating returns. Almost a universal law of nature is speeding things up more and more. I have a big question mark about that. If it's true, he would have discovered something 
very interesting and amazing, but I don't think it's much improvement. He's also been pointing out an important difference between thinking about linear extrapolations into the future and exponential ones. Exponential uh, growth, when something feeds back to itself, is very slow at first, and then they come amazingly fast. But we tend to think in a linear way, which means that we're checking how fast it has been in the near past, and then we extrapolate that far into the future, which means that certain feedbacks we completely underestimate them and are going to get short. Ray's big <coughs> problems is, of course, that he's having this fox versus hedgehog approach. Uh, the fox knows many things, and uh, he tries a lot of different methods. That means, uh, while the hedgehog knows one thing and applies that big theory. As long as uh, Ray applies uh, the law of accelerating returns, I think he's going to be wrong. But when he's a fox, looking at different data and uh, approximating them, he's going to be right on average. He's over-optimistic, but so are we all. Even the Luddites are uh, optimistic and overconfident in their ability to predict the future. And I think the most important part is that it might hopefully get us to start thinking about how can we manage the amazing risks and possibilities of the near future. Because we can't trust the extrapolation that they just did. If we're going to solve the pension problem, for example, we need to assume that there is a certain probability, maybe a small one, that we're going to get radical life extension. If we don't do that, some of the, the pension funds are going to be in much worse trouble than they are. If uh, we don't think about the possibility of humanity going extinct because of machine intelligence, we're not going to try, try to think uh, about a smarter way of getting around that. So I think what we should be really thank you Ray, for is bringing out these ideas of either the bigger, broader, brighter, more scary future. But then what we need to bring to it is, of course, a critical look and try to figure out, okay, what, how can we think sensibly about it? Thank you. So, many thanks, Anders. <coughs> so, I'm sure you've got some questions, but hold them for the time being until we have a, have a chance to hear from all the panelists. So, Anders is more of a philosopher these days. The next speaker has a background as a physicist and a software engineer. Don't know if any of you have ever used the CASA music sharing service at some stage in your life. Has anybody used something called Skype? That. Well, in each case, you're using software which uh, Jan Allen uh, wrote significant parts of. So, uh, Jan uh, describes himself nowadays as a singularitarian hacker, investor, physicist in that order. And he's going to give us his take on the transcendent man. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Jan Lennon and I find myself living a rather peculiar life. I was born behind the Iron Curtain to a nation uh, that was suffocating under the weight of Soviet occupation. And my future looked uneventful and bleak. But then computers happened to me. Shortly after I had learned how to program them, uh, the Iron Curtain fell. Uh, and arguably one of the reasons for that was that uh, the Soviet economy and military was not able to keep up with the uh, American counterpart that was increasingly computerized. Uh, as the world opened before me, I started a computer games development company. And we developed about a dozen game titles with our friends. Uh, but that career was cut short though, because the chips got powerful enough to produced 3D graphics uh, cards that uh, uh, pretty much killed our software-based uh, approach to computer graphics. So after a brief stint in uh, web development uh, in 1999, uh, the dot-com bubble burst, and uh, we found ourselves developing Kazaa. What turned out that the uh, bubble burst just at the right time, because uh, the chips in modems, broadband modems, got just fast enough to support swapping mu music files over the internet. So at its peak, Kazaa consumed uh, the majority of global internet traffic. <laughs> then, of course, it promptly collapsed under the weight of incoming lawsuits. <laughs> Yet again, the bad news turned out to be good after all. Because meanwhile, computers had gotten fast enough to process 
voice in real time. So the launch of Skype could not have come at a better moment. By now, Skype has grown uh, to command the biggest share of international voice traffic, and it shows no signs of stopping. But after the sale of Skype a few years ago, I found myself wondering what to do next. What could possibly be bigger and uh, more ambitious than Bazaar and Skype? And what opportunities would uh, uh, advance of Moore's law present this time? And this is where I stumbled upon the concept of technological singularity. I learned that, oh, the entire world, as we know it, is about to end. And computers and my profession have something to do with it. So I went ahead and started educating myself and those around me about uh, the concept of techno technological singularity. Obviously, you don't have to educate yourself very long before you uh, stumble upon the uh, Rick, upon Rick Kurzweil and his work. Therefore, when I heard about the upcoming Transcendent, Transcendent Man movie, I was really looking forward to it. And after seeing it, I have a few thoughts to share with you. First of all, a few words about the religious undertone of the movie <coughs> and depiction of Ray Kurzweil as a prophet. Why I acknowledge that uh, such themes work well for the movie from an artistic perspective. I think people, and especially those uh, whose attention we need to grab, uh, tend to have an allergic response to such connotations. Just think of the rapture for nerds image that took a while to shake off. So I tend to agree with Kevin Kelly's comment in the movie, and I quote, Ray's belief in this is complete. He seems to have no doubts about it, and in that sense, he is kind of a prophetic type figure. He's sort of a modern day prophet, and that's wrong. Now let's talk about another perceptional hurdle that uh, singularitarians need to uh, clear. The concept of singularity is very counterintuitive. As Kurzweil himself said in the movie, when people have some superficial reaction, I really see myself some decades ago. Indeed, having seen such reactions over and over again myself, I've identified at least three sources for them. First one was covered in the movie by Neil Kirchenfeld's remark. Uh, and I quote, what Ray does consistently is take a whole bunch of steps that everybody agrees on and take principles for extrapolating that everybody agrees on <coughs> and show the things that nobody agrees on. And you shoot the messenger because the extrapolation leads to things that just seem crazy. What this means is that people don't trust their ability to follow logical chains of thought. So they fall back to the heuristic that surprising conclusion means that there was a mistake in reason. Second source for superficial reactions, I found, is the belief that technological progress is the improvement of our tools over time. And computer is just a tool, just like any other. Therefore, people lump together the singularity predictions together with failed sens sensationalist extrapolations about other tools and technologies, <coughs> such as atomic energy, antibiotics, space rockets, etc. The problem with that particular belief is that it ignores the meta point that behind every tool is a cognitive process that designed it. And computers, unlike other tools, have the potential to not only augment that process, but to replace it. Interestingly, Kurzweil seems to ma make the same mistake in the movie when he mentions at the end of the movie that by building AI, we are building tools to accomplish the long-standing goals of humanity. No, we're not. Super intelligent AI is not a tool anymore. The third source of confusion is a bit subtle, but very, very common. People, especially non-programmers, seem to have an anthropomorphic model of a computer, a model that Eliza Dutkowski calls ghost in the machine. According to that model, computer programs a series of commands that are handed to a human-like ghost in the machine that then follows them 
much like directions we might give to someone who is lost. Importantly, such model leads people to believe that computers getting smarter really means that the ghost in the machine is getting more human-like. Starting to exhibit things like free will and potent potentially stopping following the programs that are given to it by human programmers. At which point you supposedly have to argue with it like you would uh, argue with a disobedient child. Which is of course entirely incorrect, as there is no such ghost. Instead, it's the program itself that will get smarter. So whenever it ends up doing things that programmers did not intend for it to do, intended to do, such as kill our species, it's still the programmers who directly caused this. So it's not an empty threat when Hugo the Garry's quip yet in the movie after having asked himself whether he's prepared to risk the extinction of our species for the sake of building an artillery. And the extinction of our species, should you have trouble connecting to it emotionally, really means killing you and everyone you consider close. With all that said, I'm happy that the number of people who recognize those counterintuitive ideas is steadily increasing and largely thanks to Kurzweil's work. And perhaps Karis is uh, right in saying that this very issue will dominate the politics in this century. I certainly hope so. <coughs> Let's move on. Kurzweil's principal tool is the exponential, no that Robert Metcalf in the movie. Well put. However, I think Kurzweil's complete reliance on it makes uh, his arguments easier to attack even if they support correct conclusions. For example, we've all heard the accusations of Kurzweil retrofitting data to his exponentials. Or the argument that uh, exponential trends that involve physical resources can't go on forever. Moreover, the steeper the curve, the more likely they are to stop. What's important to realize, though, is that the singularity hypothesis does not rely on the exponential curve. Instead, it relies on a special point on that progress curve, no matter what shape it is. That point is the moment when computers become better programmers than humans. We are going to be a hybrid of biological and non-biological intelligence, said Kurzweil in the movie. This prediction seemed to be one of the central themes of the movie, repeated again and again by different interviewees. While the short-term trends no doubt support the prediction, it also seems to me that in the long term, that prediction is not going to turn out. Why? This is the famous last theorem of Fermat. For three and a half centuries, mathematicians tried unsuccessfully to solve it. Until, of course, in 1995, Andrew Wise finally managed to succeed. And we didn't get any warning uh, before it did. Now, what does that have to do with AI? Well, it seems to me, uh, and this opinion is also shared by experts, I've talked to, some of them are in this audience, uh, that we do have enough computing power for self-improving superintelligence already. We just don't know the right algorithm yet. What that means is that building a superintelligent AI is likely a software problem already that will eventually be solved by someone. And not unlike the mathematical proven, mathematical theorems that are proven as well. Furthermore, it's important to note that with every year that AI algorithm re remains unsolved, the hardware marches to the beat of Moore's law. So we are kind of sitting on a hardware overhang that keeps on extending. Meaning that the first AI is likely to find itself running on a computer that's several orders of magnitude faster than necessary for human level intelligence. Not to mention that it will find an internet worth of computers to take over and retool. So this is what the birth of HI really like to look like. Good luck measuring it. Moving on. In the movie, Kurzweil points out that the implications of his ideas uh, resonate with some traditional religious ideas. For example, the idea of a profound transformation in the future, eternal life to bring back the dead. Well, to me, the above list reads like a question in an IQ test asking to point out the item that doesn't fit the list. You see, while I'm completely sold that the transformation will indeed be profound, 